just about a couple of things. Um, I think the worship this morning, Steve Kemp is going to be bringing the word to us today, so it's going to be great. And also after the service, there is prayer available. Please do make use of that. We have two people every week ready to pray with anyone who wants prayer in the craft room here. So if you do want prayer you know, at this service, just wait behind and they will come and spend time with you, which is great. Also this Thursday, uh, the 24th of June is the second of our series of seminars uh, on sharing the Word of God. And Steve is laying the, the foundations for this last time in terms of preparing. And then this verse is going to be more a little bit more interactive. Um, and uh, so it's going to be great, 7.30 this Thursday. Please book with Tess. And don't forget, the whole work was to bring three sentences on John chapter 14, verse 6, for you to share. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So it's going to be a great evening. Uh, if you didn't come to the first one, don't worry, uh, because the second one is down alone and you're very well welcome, but do go uh, with Tess. So, fantastic. Uh, and just to say, of course, as we start the service, today is Father's Day in the world, and what we do uh, as a church is we take the opportunity to bless all the uh, men or males in the church, uh, not just dads or granddads, but the men as well, and all the men... Uh, received. I hope you picked up this book. It's actually a, whatever you want it to be. It's a journal or a time to hear jot down the words of the Lord or the scriptures you've had. And there is a scripture for you uh, that we prayed about for all the men. And it says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So what I'd like to do, if all the men can stand, um, we have not many, but we've got a few. Right, everyone else, I want you to stand and stretch out your hands towards them because we're going to pray for our men. We're going to pray God's blessing. And the word of the Lord towards you men is this. Be strong and courageous and don't be afraid or discouraged because the Lord, God, your God, will be with you wherever you go. And we pray the blessing of God. We pray the anointing of God. We pray the grace of God upon you. The strength of God upon you. That you will truly be men of God. Growing closer to the Lord. Growing closer to Jesus. And representing, representing God himself. Hallelujah. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap. Amen. Amen. So we're going to start off with a, a brilliant song that just declares Jesus as the Lion of Judah and the Lamb of God. And when the lion roars, the devil runs. And when the lamb sheds his blood, the devil is powerless. So let's, let's go for this this morning. And give God our gift, our praise, because he is truly the Lion and the Lamb. Hallelujah, Lord. Just bless him now before we start. Just go for your mouth.
sin and darkness, whose blood is mighty and so much strong, that the King of glory, the King of all kings, and he is here. So let's proclaim that, shall we, this morning. And if you need healing, listen to what Leslie said. If you need healing, during this song, you lay hands, you do this, you lay hands on that area of your body and receive the healing that God has for you today. Hallelujah.
So Lord, just pray for you. So you receive that prayer. You receive that prayer. Receive that life of God. This is body ministry. Receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit again. Receive your healing. Receive from God. So we'll pray for you. Receive it. Just like Leslie prayed for herself. So we'll pray for you this morning. Let's receive it. Let's receive it. We're going to start this song. Just keep receiving and join in the song when you're ready. The song's called Cornerstone. And we sing it, but, but just keep receiving from God and then join us when you want.
matters in you. Everything finds its place and position in you. And we stand in that position this morning in Christ. Um, amen. We're going to have our prayer time now. Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to our Heavenly Father. And I thank the Lord that uh, when seeking the Lord and what to bring to before the throne of grace, He gave me Father's Day, so it was a no-brainer. There's many needs, the Lord knows them all. But this morning, Heavenly Father, on this special day, we give you thanks for our earthly fathers, whether with us still or departed who in union with our mothers brought us into the world precious gifts from God and from that time on dedicated to, to themselves to provide for us and to raise us in security with tender loving care and attention until we are or were able to stand on our own two feet and maybe become fathers ourselves. For those fathers who for many reasons and circumstances may have failed us in some way, Lord, we still pray a blessing upon yep. each and every one of them, and ask for the grace that in accordance with your word, we may find it in our hearts to forgive them, as you also forgave us. We pray also for those of us who have become fathers ourselves, that you would keep us able to care for our children, to love them and provide for them and to be an example of them, of your unwavering and unconditional love towards us, your children. Yes, we also remember and give thanks for those who, like Joseph, the earthly father of your only begotten son, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, find themselves in the role of a stepfather, that their love and care would be the same as if it were for their own yes, flesh and blood. Yes. And finally, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise and the adoration of our hearts that while we were still sinners, you gave us your only begotten Son to pay the price for all our sins and make possible an everlasting relationship with you, our Heavenly Father. <laughs> These Amen. things we pray in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Let's just settle ourselves. And he's already here. We don't have to find him. We just draw close to him. And he draws close to us. And so you will know this so well, most of you, what a beautiful man. I just encourage you, you try and close your eyes to sing this prayer and check the words out. And let it be your love song to the Lord this morning. Let it be your gift to Him. You know, you were the Word from the beginning. What with God the Lord knows how. What a beautiful man He is. Let's stand for Him. For His beauty and glory and holiness. Just get your hearts ready. Just try and. I see Jesus seated on the throne in glory and majesty. He's done it all. He's won it all for us. He's been through the cross and the resurrection and now he's seated in power, ruling from the throne. That's all Jesus. Beautiful, wonderful and powerful.
just as we wait on the Lord, if you feel the Lord has given you a, a word, just raise your hand and we'll get the microphone to you. Yeah, please, God. Good morning. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Steve. <laughs> My heart sort of leapt when I heard Keith share just earlier on about how the Lord brings us miracles every day. I firmly believe that to be true. They're not always the sort of earth-shattering, news at ten type supernatural things that grabs the news of the press, but they're God's special, sometimes seemingly small things, but... They're special because they're just for you and just for me. And Mandy and I had a day like that yesterday when, after the best part of 18 months, we were able to be reu reunited with my children and grandchildren. We haven't seen them since the Christmas before last because of COVID. And we were able to spend the day in my younger daughter's back garden with a barbecue and... It was not high octane stuff, it was just gentle. It was just beautiful. And God let it all flow. And you will be thinking of times like that. And my, my son and son in law and daughter were sharing me, you know, God is very much on the move in our nation at the moment. This is not just overseas, this is here in the UK. They belong to a church in Cheshire, in Crewe, that was just over a hundred strong. Their building is smaller than ours, so they just can't get in it on a Sunday. And so they've been uh, hiring, a church, uh, hiring a school building, which obviously became immediately difficult when the COVID re regulations had come on. So they've been streaming services live uh, from uh, just a handful of people in their building each week and everybody else is sitting at home and enjoying it in and they all come along alphabetically different congregation each week so they get through them all and in the last 15 months their congregation has grown to 200 and over 20 have come in as asylum seekers from Iran where a number of them became Christians out there in that hostilely Islamic country that is very anti-Christian and then had to flee for their lives so the members of family came with them and have found Jesus since they've been in Cheshire and they baptised six of them last week. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> so God is at work. I want to share a few verses of scripture from Luke chapter 7 and verse 11. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain. His disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. The large crowd from the town was with her. 
When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. And then he went and touched the bier they were carrying him on. And the bearer stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up. That must have been a bit scary, you know. A dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. <laughs> what an extraordinary story that is about the funeral that never happened. I guess Jesus probably didn't have a lot of close friends amongst funeral directors. <laughs> Kept raising people back to life and we'll have a look at that. What a tremendous story about a funeral that got cancelled. However, today's message is bigger, wider, and far, far larger than just this one extraordinary incident which is massive in itself. God has a special message for each one of us today, and it's exactly the same message it's just two words, and it's get up. Get up. Jesus commands, get up. He came across this... <laughs> Thank you, Keith. Instant obedience. Jesus came across this funeral procession as he was about his daily business. And so inevitably, as was always the case, things turned out quite differently than expected because Jesus was on the scene. And isn't that always the case? When Jesus is around, nothing's quite as you would normally expect it to be. It turns out quite different. I wonder, was there another person upon the entire planet that had the vaguest notion that what was about to happen in the town of Nain on that very special day other than Jesus himself? Who could have expected the unfolding of those events? And today, it's no different. God has a special plan for each member of this congregation, each person in this room today. For you and for me, this is a special day. As I was trying to share on Thursday evening, when you have the call upon your God, God, call upon your life to share the word of God. As you approach the pulpit or wherever it is, there's always that fee, always that feeling of excitement in your spirit. And then, some days, there is that feeling of super excitement. And today's one of those days. <laughs> What have you got planned for today? Because God has plans, and he has plans for you, and his plans are get up. So let's have a quick peek at some of that. First of all, he speaks about arising from death, and perhaps this gives us a picture of salvation. Let's travel to Mark's Gospel and chapter 5, and verse 41 and 42. Jesus took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means... Little girl, I say to you, guess what? Get up. And immediately, the girl stood up. We need to explain, because we've missed the previous contacts, that this girl is dead. Okay. And immediately, the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. <laughs> and the Bible just sums up in this very short verse. <laughs> At this, they were completely astonished. <laughs> Isn't that a kind of capping the whole thing? I think they were considerably more than astonished. But the Bible just caps it into that short sentence. So basically the story is this. A ruler from the local synagogue has sought out Jesus. He's gone, he's left his house because his 12-year-old daughter is dreadfully sick and ill and appears to be at the point of death. He goes to find Jesus in the hope and in the expectation that Jesus is the answer to his daughter's condition. But by the time they arrive back at his house, it seems like it's all too late, that there's nothing left to be done. His daughter 
has already died. That Jesus received that message whilst they were en route, but kept coming because there was a bigger plan about to unfold. So Jesus enters the house, he puts out the wailing doubters, and he takes the dead child lying out on the bed and commands her to get up, and she does. She gets up. <laughs> and then Jesus somehow places this completely impossible expectation upon them. Well, don't mention it. Don't talk about it. Don't share it. Keep quiet about it. I got a feeling they didn't talk about anything else for months on end afterwards. And every time this little girl walked outside of the house, she was a blazing testimony to the electrifying power that Jesus possesses. Here's another verse, Acts chapter 9 and verse 40 and 41. Turning towards the dead woman, Peter said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. So time has moved on. Jesus has died, been resurrected, ascended to heaven. The early church is beginning to expl explode. And here in a place called Joppa is a lady called Tabitha, also known as Dorcas, a fervent, very active member of the local church fellowship who suddenly grows gravely ill and dies. It just so happened, or... Did it just so happen that the Apostle Peter was visiting nearby at a town called Lydda? So grieving church members shot off to try and fetch Peter to come back in the expectation that something was going to happen. So he comes. He goes into the woman's room. He takes the dead woman's hand, commands her to get up, and up she gets. It's she who has been dead has been restored to life. So we see in each one of these instances, a dead person is prayed for, touched, restored to life. Just as we read at the beginning in this funeral procession in the town of Nain. So I can see your cogs whirring in your brain and asking the question, so what's the relevance Steve, what has this to do with our congregation here at Fylde Christian Service Church this morning? Just have a quick look around the congregation and see if you can see anybody that looks like they're dead. <laughs> Nobody's giving that appearance, not even me. I'm awake and sharp and alert this morning, okay? So it's not something, you're not talking about a physical death then here this morning. That's clearly not relevant. Nobody has expired. Nobody has stopped breathing in their seats. None are on their deathbed. None are breathing their last. But the Bible does speak to us about a far worse death than stopping breathing than the cessation of physical life. In fact, the Bible reveals to us that populating this world are millions of sort of, you could call them living dead men and living dead women. They exist, but they've never begun to really live. Not in the sense that God intended for them. That part of them, their spirit, that reaches out to God, remains dead. It has no communication. There is no, as yet, relationship between them and him. There is no contact. Listen to what the Bible has to say about that. It says in Romans 5 and verse 12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, death came to all men, because all sinned. And then in Romans 6 and verse 23, it says the wages of sin, the pay, the cash, the reward is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So sin is the problem. 
Sin is the problem. That's what cuts us us off from God. That's what renders our spirit dead and not living. It's that sin problem that needs to be dealt with in order that that life, that life that flows from God, might be injected into each one of us. You see, it's our due wages for living, trying to live a life without God. It can't successfully be done. At best, it's in existence. It's not a life at all. We weren't made for that. And there is worse news. We all have the problem. It says in Romans 3 and verse 23, all, just a three-letter word, and yes, that tiny word embraces everyone that walks the planet in the past, present, and future. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, God's examination pass mark is 100%. Anything less is a fail. Mandy's going through that awful time of year at college where all the exam results are, well, that will have been not so much exam results as teacher tests this year. Examination boards are not setting exams. And it all hangs on how well the students do in the work that they hand in. And I can tell you, not a single one of them has had 100% on their papers. That's God's expectation from you and I. In medieval England, they used to play a special game. It was played amongst archers. And from a quiver of arrows, they would take six arrows and aim those arrows at the center of a target a certain distance away. If every one of those six arrows hit the center of the target, the bullseye, the gold, in the middle, they were designated a saint. But if but one arrow missed the centre of the target, albeit by a millimetre, or if all six completely missed the target altogether, it was completely irrelevant. As long as just one missed by a fraction, they were designated a sinner. And that gives us a graphic picture of the reality of our standing before God. We each have the problem of sin. We've come short of the mark. We've messed up in thought, in word, and in deed. We've done things we shouldn't do, and we've not done things we should have done. And so that presents a blockage, because God can't live with sin. Not heard from God recently? Well, that might be because of unforgiven sin in your life. It's always a blockage. But there's good hope this morning, isn't it? We're all in the right place. You like the church. You're in the service. It's not like it's the first time you've been here. You've been singing the songs, swaying to the music maybe, love the preaching, and let's face it, we have really excellent preaching here. We're very privileged. You feel the love of the brothers and sisters around you. You appreciate the camaraderie, the family feel. You feel like this is a good place to belong, and yet somehow... You don't quite feel that you do. It's a bit like an outsider looking in, standing on the edge, almost there, on the boundary, on the very limit, just outside the door, but not quite taking the step in yet. Why is that? Because you've not yet made your life right with Jesus. You've not yet been born again. You have not yet sought his forgiveness. You have not yet given your life to Jesus. You've not come to the point of repentance and said, I'm done with this life of living like this. I can't do this anymore. I need to live for Jesus. I need to know his life, his power, his love, his forgiveness in me. Still dead in your spirit, although in the right place. Not right with God yet. Friend, there's nothing more important this day or any day, then we get our lives totally right with God and receive Jesus into our lives. The good news is that he is at hand to reach out, to touch you, and to help you up, to bring you his more abundant life. You could go out of this room this morning with your eternal destiny completely changed and turned around in a moment, brought and adopted into his family. And we will give the opportunity for that to happen in just a few minutes' time at the end of this preach. So if that's you, 
log that up here. Don't move from there. And we'll come back to that in just a short period of time. You see, I was just a lad, and I used to go to church three times every Sunday. That's pretty good. That's pretty impressive. Actually, I didn't have any say in it, because my dad was the pastor. And he couldn't leave me at home. So, and mum played the organ, so we all had to travel together. In fact, I was so super spiritual, I used to go to church before I was born. Whilst my mum was carrying me, she took me to church. But you know, it was many years on before suddenly I realised, it doesn't matter who my dad is, it doesn't matter that some folk think he's the big cheese in the local church, it doesn't matter that I go to church umpteen times every week, what does matter is that the slate is right clean, that I give my life to Jesus, that I need my sins forgiven, no one can do that for me or in my place, I needed to do that for myself. And I'm so glad at the age of seven. I took that step Jesus came into my life my spirit suddenly came alive of course I didn't at that age understand all the theology of it all but I knew enough to know that Jesus loves me and that my sin was forgiven I was speaking to my son-in-law Stephen yesterday I got three son-in-laws all called Steve I don't know how it happens before I moved up here I'd never met anybody else called Steve now every other person is called Steve but that's Anyway, I was talking to this young man, and he was in the church that I was pastoring at Crewe many, many, many moons back now, and was thrown out of the youth meeting just about every week for the disruption that he used to bring. He tried burning his school down on one occasion, but on one but there was that wonderful day when he finally came to his senses, invited Jesus into his life, and his spirit came alive. And now we were, just yesterday, I was privileged to bless 20 years of marriage between him and my daughter. Little did I know he was going to marry my older daughter when I first went to their church. And three beautiful children, all growing up, loving Jesus and serving him. But he had to come to that decision for himself. And he did. God reached out and touched him and said, get up. Up he got new divine life breathed into his spirit let's move on secondly let's have a look at a few more scriptures that speak about arising from sickness talk about restoration in Matthew 9 verse 6 and 7 Jesus said to the paralytic get up you knew that was coming didn't you take your mat and go home the man got up and went home. Most of you, that just brief excerpt will give you a clue as to a very, very familiar story that exploded in the town of Capernaum one morning when Jesus was preaching indoors to a home that had been kindly loaned to him and was bursting to the seams, hardly a square inch, a cubic inch for anyone to enjoy, cram-packed tight, unable to even open the door to let another individual in. But this was no source of frustration to the four faithful friends who had brought their paralysed friend on his mat. Not deterred, they travelled to the flat roof of the same building, make a hole in the roof. It must have been a strong roof and not all fall through, I guess. I often wonder about this story, but God was often in it from hand to feet. And interestingly, they lower him down. There is a suggestion that they lowered him through on ropes. So did they expect that they were going to have to do this? I don't know. But they had everything to hand that they needed to do. And they lower him through the roof. Their faith told them that if they could just get their friend to Jesus, then everything would be well. They were right. It was well. Jesus addressed the man. What did he do? First of all, he did what we have just been speaking about. He forgave his sins. He addressed his sin problem. And then he commanded him to do the one thing he couldn't do. He said, get up. Well, he hadn't done that in donkey's years. He couldn't walk. He'd been stuck on this bed. But he did just that. 
and he takes up his stretcher and walks, wraps it under his arm and travels home again. Before he met Jesus, his limbs wouldn't work. After he met him and obeyed him, they worked perfectly. <laughs> Here's another similar story from the New Testament. In Acts chapter 3, verse 6 and 8, Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Some, rever some inspirations put, get up as you might imagine. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet, it says, and began to walk. Again, it's another well-known story. After Jesus' ascension, the early church was experiencing hostile persecution on the one hand, but phenomenal growth on the other. And two of its very different leaders, Peter and John, I don't think they could have been two more different individuals on the planet than those two. And they are walking side by side together to the temple with the intention to pray at the hour of prayer. And they encounter this familiar crippled man by the gate beautiful. This won't have been the first time he had sat there. He probably done that for the best part of his life. Perching himself probably in the best begging spot in town because he was unable to work. Crippled from birth, his only means of income was in this kind of manner. What better place to beg than at the temple gates where the religious zealots were coming to discharge their religious duties. And so he begs finances from the two apostles, but their pockets are empty. They have nothing physical to give him. So they give him something better. Peter says in modern parlance, get up. Come on, walk. And he helps him by the hand. And for the first time, remember this is, the first time in this man's entire existence, he gets to his feet. And standing led to walking. And walking led to running. And running led to leaping. And leaping led to dancing. He went through the whole caboodle with these limbs that just a few seconds before couldn't do anything at all. What a difference Jesus makes, doesn't he? Both instances that we just read about, sick people, very sick people, were made well. And the sign that they were healed was that they responded positively to the command to get up. Is the Lord sending you the same command today? Has sin perhaps laid you aside in your spiritual walk? Have you, in recent times, taken to your spiritual bed, been diverted from your Christian journey? Have your travels ground to a halt? Have you been laid, perhaps, on your back, making little, if no progress at all? Your focus has been taken away from him. There has been heavy distraction. Have you been doing your own thing recently? Has he lost that first place in your life? Are we making so much more of our genuine problems, perhaps, than we should be making? Has our attention turned away from him whilst other things have gained greater importance in our life? Here's another familiar verse. I've read, I have heard Keith read this verse on a Sunday morning dozens of times. 1 John 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Finish. Yes, you've heard it before too. And read it too. He knows that we're prone to make a mess of things. So he's made provision for all of that in advance. Still his blood avails. Still he forgives, still he cleanses, still perhaps he awaits our confession. He looks for us to get up, to start walking with again, hit him again. I wonder if that's what you might do. Here's another scripture, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. How's your knowledge of God lately? Have you grown more distant? Have other things got in the way? Spiritual sickness crept in as sin has gained a foothold. Will you take the opportunity this morning to get up again today? Don't stay down there on your back. He's commanding you to arise. There is new health and strength and healing for you if you will only get up. 
There's life-changing power in his words. He reaches out to touch you. Just like the father was awaiting the return of the prodigal in the parable all those years before. Was that the first day he stood out there scanning the horizon, wondering if his son might come back today? I have a sneaking feeling he'd been out there every day since his son left. He was just waiting for the opportunity when he might get up, come to his senses and return to the home. And then last but not least, there are also some verses that speak about arising from sleep, rejuvenation, waking up, moving on again. Let's take another look at an important Bible verse as we focus our minds on this last thought that I want to share with you. It's not about death, it's not about sickness, but it's about slumber, spiritual sleep. Take a look. Luke 22 and verse 46. Why are you sleeping? Jesus asked them. Get up. And pray so that you're not fall into temptation. Again, the Bible narrative is probably familiar to many of us. It follows the Last Supper and, uh, with, G with, with his disciples. And Jesus had taken away just his inner circle of three close disciples to watch and pray with him whilst he agonized in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, spending this special time of prayer with his father on the night that he was soon after betrayed, taken captive, and the next day crucified. Three times on that evening, Jesus returned to find them asleep. And on this third occasion, he charges them with the imperative to get up and pray, because the urgency of the hour was upon them. Shortly afterwards, Judas's betrayer leads a gang of the temple guards and elders to take him captive. In Romans 13 and verse 11, we read, The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And that verse comes as part of a weighty letter to the church in Rome, penned by Paul the Apostle, probably on his third missionary journey. It comes fairly on in a fairly lengthy letter of some 16 chapters. That took some reading. And he has a lot to say, but here he spends time drawing attention to the need of being on the spiritual alert. And there's only one remedy for inappropriate sleep, and that's to wake up and get up. There's no point in opening our eyes in order to just simply stay lying there with our heads still on the pillow. But with our newfound awareness should come activity. So we need to get up and get on. And so is this just this, this final little question that I toss into your thoughts this morning. Could you be spiritually sleeping? Could you be unaware of what's going on in the world around you? Are you simply going through the motions and failing to take in the subtle strategies of the enemy? Do we really understand the signs of the times? Do we understand how close Christ's return actually is? Will we heed his biblical warning from Christ's own mouth? Mark 13 and verse 36. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. See, the signs are there, but do we see them? The thief's entire plan embraces the importance of catching the householder unawares. He will come when he or she is off their guard, when they are sleeping. And we live in momentous times. As I was just sharing at the beginning, there are massive opportunities for evangelism in the time in which we live. But equally, the enemy is making huge inroads into the political thinkings of governments across the entire world at this time. And fearful legislation is being passed in the EU, which thankfully we've turned our back on, even as we speak today. Abortion is going to become a human right, apparently rather than even required to be legislated in law, it's an expectation. Do we see what's coming? Are we ready or are we sleeping? One final verse to contemplate. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 6. So then, let's not be like others who are asleep, but let's be alert and self-controlled. See, there's a lot of spiritual slumber going on, and whilst the church has been napping, marriage has been under attack across the globe. Same-sex relationships have been popularised. Abortion has become a legitimised form of contraception. Repeated attempts are being made through legislation to stem the evangelism of the church, to hamstring its worship. And whilst the form of religion embraces an anemic and spineless 
and increasingly irrelevant posturing. Any attempt to endorse, to believe and practice the truth of the Bible is openly ridiculed and shackled, if at all possible. Friends, it's time for us to wake, get up. We must become aware. We need to, I feel sure more than ever, take a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. Be aware of the signs of the times and what the scripture has to say about them. We need to be praying intelligently and living powerfully because he's soon coming. What kind of church will he find? Let's just pray for a couple of moments. So God says, get up. Will you do that? Or are you going to stay there on your back? Not really living. The alternative, actually, is quite unthinkable, undesirable, unattractive, unwholesome, unhelpful. His commands are imperative. They're life-giving, life-changing. And this morning, he holds out his hand to touch us, to help us up. There is life and there is power in his touch. Will he find obedience to his words and will we get up? He doesn't expect us to do it alone. We can't. We weren't built for that. That wasn't his attention. He'll be with us every step of the way. But we can in response to his invitation. So don't leave it a moment longer to respond to his command to get up and to be saved, to be forgiven, to give your life to him. If you're on a sick bed, a spiritual sick bed this morning that involves perhaps each aspect of your health, your physical health, your emotional health, your mental health, your relational health, your physically your spiritual health. Is your relationship with God out of sorts? Then now is the opportunity to get up and put it right. Have you been spiritually sleeping? He encourages you to wake up and get up. Be aware that he is coming soon to become familiar with the signs of the age in which we are living. Time is too short to be wasted. We need to be use it wisely. He says. Get up. So I just want to lead in a prayer of salvation. Now, it may well be, and if that's the case, that's fantastic, that every one of us knows Jesus. But I want you, what I want you to do is if you are saved and you know Jesus, will you pray this prayer with me in faith on behalf of somebody else that you are seeking to lead to the Lord Jesus Christ? Make this an act of faith. See with the eyes of faith that they are certainly, in God's timing, going to come to Jesus. And make that stand that claim before him this morning, they need to be getting up and to experience his life. But if this is you, and you've not yet found him as saviour, today, surely, is your day. Don't stand on the edge anymore, but invite him into your life. Make this your prayer quietly in your seat. In fact, let's stand together, shall we? Let's just stand together. And make this your prayer if this is you. If this is not you, there is someone that you know that you want to be in the kingdom of heaven. Then make this their prayer. Pray in faith on their behalf with expectancy that God is going to move on them. So, dear Lord Jesus, I realize that I have sinned. And I'm truly sorry. My sin has hurt you. And I deeply regret that. I want to turn away from my sin. I need your help to do that. I turn my back upon the life I've previously lived. And I invite you into my life. To become my Lord. My Savior. My King. My Master. I believe that you died for me. I believe that your blood cleanses me from sin. I believe that you rose from the grave. And you live to be my friend and my saviour. And I invite you into my life today. That I might begin to live like never before. Show me how to love you and to serve you, and to worship you. And if you've just, amen, and if you've just slipped away from the Lord and your focus has been elsewhere, then just pray this prayer this morning. Father God, I've been distracted. I've allowed my attention to focus on unimportant things. And my relationship with you has suffered. Found myself in wayward places 
And I hear your voice this morning telling me to get up. Lord, I don't want to stay down there in the gutter anymore. I don't want to lie on that bed of immobility anymore. But Lord, as you hold my hand, I want to stand up, learn to love you, serve you. And Lord, will you awaken, open their eyes, stir us from slumber, help us to be aware of all that's going on around us, to speak up for God, for our Lord, for our Savior, for his kingdom, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we'll stay on our feet to finish because we've got a great song which is in keeping with that word. It's stand up, stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. We want to thank you, Father, that a word was not just a word, it was, a, a, it was a, a, a command, it was an encouragement. And we do that. We rise up, we get up, and we stand. We stand for Jesus, we stand for the kingdom, we stand for truth, we stand for salvation. We stand. And Lord, this, this song, we, it was written by William Booth from the Salvation Army, and it's just a great battle song in this world at this time. <clears throat> Let's stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up.